Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. After decades of the tense unpredictability of the Cold War and the brief euphoric moment that marked the fall of communism, it is clear that the world has shifted once again. What now seems certain is uncertainty, a kaleidoscope of new realities falling into new patterns, all of them complex and some of them ominous. How America navigates its ship of state in the turbulent waters of the early 21st century depend, depends fundamentally on two things. First, an accurate assessment of new world realities, and secondly, the discipline to act wisely, positively, and confidently to meet them. My guest is Lee Hamilton, President and Director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Lee Hamilton, welcome to Dialogue. Nice to be with you, George. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Lee. And I'm going to ask you a big, bold, broad question <laughs> right to start with. Lee, what kind of world is this? I mean, what I'm thinking of when I, when I put it that bluntly is it seems to me you have a changing landscape, if you will, of powers as you and I sit here, of those that are merging, those that are declining, and us right up there at the, at the top of a very shaky hill. Well, you said it very well when you said it's a very uncertain world and in some ways dangerous, but also a world with a lot of opportunity for the United States in, in the years ahead. A fellow my age, of course, looks back and sees the Cold War. Mm -hmm. You and I grew up in the Cold Absolutely. War. And in many ways, it was a simpler world, at mm -hmm. least in retrospect. The United States, Soviet Union, uh, the two great powers uh, head to head and uh, more manageable, I think, than the kind of world we're in today. Now, the good news is that we're probably not going to be seeing in the near future anything like that. Uh, there's no rival to the United States in the near term that would threaten our military supremacy or our political uh, supremacy or economic. Uh, so it is a very different world. It's a, it's a world with more complex uh, centers, right. more complex uh, problems, I believe, and a great challenge. If you look at the world today, you, you see certain realities that really jump out at you. Right. Uh, one of them, I think you've suggested them. One is American power, just unheard of, the kind of uh, power we have in this world today. No matter how you, uh, what kind of metrics you use, military or economic or political, or, or you mentioned cultural a moment ago, uh, that has to be one of the central realities of the world today. And so it's a world in which we, for all this power that we have, Lee, and I think you give it proper emphasis, yeah. are faced with some very vexing and nuanced challenges. I mean, for example, on this, this issue that you very rightly point out of the way that the power landscape is shifting, so to speak, and that bipolar world that you and I so uh, memorably knew is no longer here. I guess one of the major questions in terms of our power, in terms of using it and uh, adjusting to the reality is, how do we accommodate these new, for example, China? Yeah. Now, what does that mean to us? What does it mean to us in the sense of a Europe that may be emerging as not just a partner, but something of a friendly rival? Are, are these the new? Nuances, if you will. Well, they are indeed. I, I think one of the really big things that strikes you as you look out on the world today is just what you're talking about, the emerging powers. Mm -hmm. Anywhere in Washington you go today and sit down and talk to people, you won't get very far into the conversation before the word China comes exactly. up. Exactly. And in a sense, we almost have a fixation on China now with two very distinct schools of thought. One really kind of a confrontational view. Uh, there are some people in this town who argue, look, we're going to clash at some time in the future. We may as well get ready for it. Uh, I'm not in that school. The other school would be more of an engagement school to see if we can bring them into the international system. But it's not just China. We're very cogniz cognizant of the fact now of, uh, about India because the president just visited India. Right. And that's an extraordinary thing, a president of the United States spending days in India uh, reaching an agreement, a controversial agreement with them on nuclear power. So India and China are big powers on the rise. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the 21st century will be shaped uh, depends in large measure 
on our relationship with China and our relationship with India. I think uh, you're absolutely right about that, Lee, and of course that's getting uh, a lot of attention. We hope it gets the right kind of attention as we develop our strategies yeah. and policies. But it's also truly, and one of the things I'm personally uh, interested in and increasingly concerned about are other regions that may not be getting the highlights. Mm -hmm. That, uh, For example, Africa as kind of an, age, an area in which uh, the problems are so many, the potential is mm -hmm. so great, but the attention uh, may not be all that we need internationally. And then Latin America, where mm -hmm. it looks to me like trends may be uh, somewhat more confrontational than they used to be in terms of our relationships. Well, I, th I think you're right. I, I look out on the world and I see a lot of turmoil out there. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it in Latin America, some of it in uh, Africa. Uh, you have weak states or failed states that you have to deal with. You've got uh, diseases you have to deal with. You have all kinds of instability. And, of course, you have the phenomenon of terrorism and our whole relationship with the, the uh, political Islam. Uh, all of these things are big challenges to the American policymaker. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa, of course, is, uh, is a huge and diverse continent. Latin America likewise, and the fact of the matter is we just don't pay that much attention to them. Uh, four million people die in the Congo in the past few years, and uh, you can hardly find mention of it in an American newspaper. Uh, and of course the, the turmoil in the Great Lakes region, which has been horrendous. Uh, so. Uh, there are a lot of problems that do not come to the attention of Americans, or at least we don't focus on them very much. Mm -hmm. Latin America, uh, a, a number of elections down there that haven't necessarily gone the way we'd, I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> we'd like them to go, exactly. uh, which raises the question about democracy and uh, its role. Uh, you've had a number of states in Latin America that have moved to the left, not all by any means, but some have. And uh, I, I think that uh, Latin America is another continent that we have very much neglected. And have to get re-engaged with. Absolutely. Lee, I'd like to talk a bit about American power, which you mentioned mm -hmm. at the outset, and is one of, one of the, and American power itself is a complex topic. It's not just military, well, and I think we'd want to establish that right off the bat. But it strikes me, and I'd love to get your opinion on Lee, that our exercise of it is vexed by some, some very, very, uh, uh, tough definitions. For example, the world, I think historically we can say, has, uh, has relied upon American power in many instances, still calls upon it and feels great reassurance when it's used in, mm -hmm. in, in certain ways, and yet there's increasing resentment of it. Yeah. It seems to be on the horns of that dilemma to start with, even when we well, I, I think begin that, to think about it. Well, I think it's a very good observation because both things are true. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that impresses me here in this town is that you have this constant stream of foreign ministers and kings and prime ministers uh, every day mm -hmm. in Washington. They all come to this town with uh, one request, uh, help us out. <laughs> uh, right, right, they, right. They may right. want money, they may want military support, they may want political support, they may want a photo op with the president. Mm -hmm. uh, they all come here and want help because the United States is the strongest actor anywhere in the globe. And our support, or lack of it, can be decisive for all, all kinds of countries. So they, they want us to help, but at the same time, and this is the other point you make, really, and that is there is a resentment uh, that is very apparent mm -hmm. of American power. And we often exercise power in ways that uh, create hostilities and resentment. And so that's a hard thing for Americans to understand. Uh, because we think we're pretty nice people. I think we're pretty nice people. You too. think so. Right. Uh, we think our intent is good, yeah. uh, and yet we, we create reactions to American power. And as we both know, Re uh, Lee, these reactions have gotten to be pretty intense, and they now encompass not just uh, people that we have traditionally had tough relations with, but some of our friends. And I don't think either one of us is going to necessarily answer it at this table today, but how do we approach that? I mean, how, how does this country constructively sort of uh, embellish, if you will, those relationships? Well, uh, uh, the simple answer is uh, in the word sensitivity. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I just think Americans have to be more sensitive to our, uh, the problems of our, uh, uh, our friends and maybe our enemies as well. Um, if you go, for example, to Latin America today and you sit down and talk to them about terrorism, well, they're interested in that topic. 
uh, they've dealt with that phenomenon. We've had to deal with it. There is a commonality of interest there. But if we walk away from the table, having just talked about terrorism, uh, they're going to come away very dissatisfied. Uh huh. Right. Because yeah. they have of, their agenda. Right. And their agenda is economic development, mm -hmm. uh, closing the inequality gap, poverty, uh, and a lot of these things. And so. My point about sensitivity is that Americans have to uh, obviously deal with our agenda, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. terrorism in my example, but we also have to be sensitive to the agenda of the other countries and not walk away from the table when the topic comes up. I think that's excellent, quite frankly. Yeah. Lee, sensitivity and realizing these, these discussions should be multidimensional. They should. Lee, uh, let me put a very blunt question again on, this, on the topic of power to you, and, and that is uh, our military, the, the military dimension of it, our use of it. Yeah. And uh, the blunt question is this, are we uh, overextended militarily? Do you think we're in too many places doing too many things? My answer is yes. Uh, I think we are. I think there has been a strong element of opinion in this country that uh, has thought in times past, I think less today, mm -hmm. that uh, military power in and of itself can solve problems. I don't think any rational American would say that military power is unimportant. Mm -hmm. uh, and diplomacy often has to be supported by military power. But to think that you can solve problems with military action alone is a very grave mistake. And I think the real challenge that confronts us on American power is how you integrate all of the tools mm -hmm. of American power. Now, the military is certainly one of the tools of American power. Uh, covert actions, paramilitary actions, I include in that. But uh, we have to be able to take uh, our economic power, uh, our uh, uh, public diplomacy, uh, our uh, law enforcement, and uh, our environmental mm -hmm. concerns, and all the rest of it, we have to be able to integrate. Let's take the question of terrorism. Uh, you, you cannot solve the problem of terrorism with military action alone. Uh, you can go into Afghanistan, use military power, and you can set Osama bin Laden back. But if you're really going to fight terrorism, you have to use the United States Treasury to try to cut off their financing. Uh, you have to use border control to try to stop them from coming in here. Uh, you have to use uh, economic aid in order to try to bring some hope to hopeless societies. Uh, you have to use public diplomacy to try to tell people the good story right. about America. And the, the key here is not the use of any one tool of American power, but it's integrating all of the tools right. of American power against the phenomenon of terrorism. Let me see that and raise you one, if I might. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I think integration is a word you rightly bring in yeah. the conversation. I'm really struck by that. I think yeah. you're absolutely right. right. We have to integrate all of these tools. Yeah. Do we also have to stretch that integration to our approach to alliances worldwide? To, you're, uh, you're, in other words, not acting yeah. alone and always seeking yeah. to. You're right on target, I believe, George, because you, you, you have to integrate American power in an internal sense. That's what I was talking about a moment ago. But you also have to recognize that as you look at these problems around the world, uh, we can't solve them mm -hmm. by ourselves. Uh, how do you solve nuclear proliferation by yourself? Hmm. You can't do it. Exactly. You've got to have cooperation. Uh, how do you solve the problem of drugs by yourself? You can't do that either. You've got to have help. Uh, you certainly can't solve environmental problems mm -hmm. by yourself. So you go down all the lists of uh, things that bother Americans today. And, and what you conclude is, I think, uh, is that we need help. Mm -hmm. We're awfully smart. We're very rich. Uh, we have good intentions. Uh, but having said all of that, we're not smart enough and we're not rich enough uh, to solve all of these problems by ourselves. Right. And so you, to pick up the word again, you have to integrate mm -hmm. uh, the American power, American uh, abilities in a lot of these fields with the powers of uh, other countries. Uh, t take the matter of intelligence, for example. Uh, we got marvelous intelligence capabilities in this country. But when we want to get intelligence on uh, where Osama bin Laden might be in uh, Pakistan or on uh, Muslim cells in Europe, which may immigrate to Canada and down to us, 
uh, we got to have some help from the intelligence Agreed. agencies of France and Germany and uh, uh, the UK mm -hmm. and a lot of other friends. Lee, uh, that again strikes me as a very wise combining of forces and, and, and integration of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of uh, strengths that should, yeah. be, should be brought together. I'd like to bring into this uh, one area in which we p probably have to look to ourselves alone and where we may be doing ourselves a lot of damage in, in, in terms of how we can act internationally. And that, Lee, quite frankly, is the extent to which we're in debt. <laughs> I don't know if this is an uncomfortable <laughs> subject for everyone watching or not, but it just seems to me that uh, one of the, the major security issues and, and one of the ultimate limits, perhaps, on our power is the, is the extent to which we're, we're running these terrible deficits. Well, you, such. You, you're, you're, of course, right. I, as you mentioned it, I was thinking of the flap over the Dubai. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we better get used to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is we don't have all the capital in the world today. Mm -hmm. And foreigners are going to be investing in the United States. And when they invest, they're going to invest in all kinds of things. And we need that capital because we, uh, we can't finance it ourselves. Right. That's a function of debt that you're talking about. Uh, we got two big debts. We have the debt in the federal budget and we have the current account deficit in our trade balance in the world. And we are now the largest debtor in the history of the world. Is that today. going to constrain our international well, activity at some point? I guess it already does. It already does. We would never have thought of contracting to Dubai for port uh, operations uh, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the United States is basically withdrawn from the business of managing ports. We, we don't do very much of that. If you go around our country and look at all of these ports, in most every case they're now managed by a, a foreign company of some kind. But beyond that, the question of debt bothers me. I, I mean, okay, you want to fight a war. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a choice you may want to make, but my goodness, uh, we ought to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. And we ought not to say, okay, we're going to fight the war and my grandchildren are going to pay for it. Going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, at, at this point, I'm a, a traditional fiscal conservative, George. Mm -hmm. I think we should pay for the things we, we try to do. And, of course, we live in a kind of a fantasy world. We, we want to be a world power and extend all of this power everywhere, and we want to go uh, have a war in the Balkans and have a war in Iraq, and we've uh, had American intervention of forces over a number of times in the last several decades. Okay, maybe that's the proper use of American power. You can argue about each one of them. But uh, no matter where you come out, it seems to me your obligation is to pay for what you want to do. I think that's, again, very well taken, Lee. And that, uh, that obviously would be a constraint on us. Yeah. Uh, if we decide we're going to have to pay for these things out of current income, mm -hmm. then that's going to restrain us uh, from doing a lot of things. I I'm, I'm appreciate that a lot because the last thing I read this morning as I was thinking about our conversation was the Americans are now saving less than 1%. Less than less than one uh, percent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that, that's that's yeah. stunning. It and is stunning, and you know, I used to wrestle with this uh, a lot in a legislative sense. Uh, I've heard for years and years that Americans don't save enough. Uh, okay, I accept that. Uh, why don't we save enough? Well, that gets you beyond economics. It really gets you in a kind of a a culture right. uh, where we as a people are not taught to save, we spend and uh, far beyond our income. Uh, and it's really more than uh, economics, it's uh, psychology and, and culture. Right. And I used to think about, you know, uh, if, if you look at the devices that we have put into the tax code to encourage people to save, uh, I think I've supported all of them. <laughs> But the result is minimal. Mm -hmm. We still don't save. Yeah. And, and, and so I have come to the view, I don't, this is not an argument against these uh, tax incentives to save, but I've come to the view that this problem is much more deep-seated than just economic. I think so. It's think cultural. So. It's a cultural it's a matter of psychology. Yeah. And we can yeah. be our own worst enemies in yeah. you know, talking about projection of power and world relations. And one of the ways in which it, it sort of comes home to bite us, Lee, is in this vast area we call globalization. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to get you to talk a bit about that. Uh, first of all, what you were talking about a minute ago, the, the, the extent to which we can't do so many things, uh, for example, the ports issue and stuff, yeah. where we find ourselves depending on foreign partners. That's one issue. And the other issue, of course, is the inequality in the world that's being brought smack up into our faces through what we call globalization. What are your thoughts on it? Well, my thoughts are that uh, globalization is not global. 
mm -hmm. uh, that it's a phenomenon that is with us and, and we're not going to reverse it. Right. What you're really talking about when you're talking about globalization is this uh, interconnections among people and finance and goods and services mm -hmm. and people moving across borders, instantaneous communications and all the rest. It's a, I believe, largely beneficial phenomenon. I think it's one of the central realities of the day. We're talking about American power. We're talking about the emerging nations. Nation. Globalization is one of the central realities of the day. But uh, your, your point, I think, is a genuine and that uh, genuinely legitimate, and that is that globalization while by and large works beneficially for most of us, it passes a lot of people by. This is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if, if they're not plugged into the world mm -hmm. uh, and the globalization, they slip further and further behind. Should that become a major American foreign policy issue? The fact that world in inequality is, uh, by many accounts, um, growing immensely as, as uh, globalization I, takes over. I role. think it is a huge problem domestically in this country uh, you've seen all of these figures that the growth in income is so dramatic if you're in the top 1% right. of the country or maybe even 10% and that the average wage earner is stuck in a rut and has been. Uh, it, the, incidentally, that's not easily turned around. I do think there are policies uh, that can be helpful on it, including tax uh, reform and things like raising the minimum wage and increasing training and education and all the rest of it. But it's not just a domestic issue, it's likewise an international issue. And we have to get plugged into that. Now, here, here again, uh, we got to be careful. Uh, we can't solve all these problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, let's take the question of, uh, of uh, uh, Pakistan. We now provide blank number of dollars, I'm not sure of the exact amount, to help secular schools in Pakistan. Uh, that's not going to change the world in Pakistan. Uh, it's probably a, a drip or two in their budget. But terribly important, at least in my view, because it sends the signal that, look, we're sensitive to your problem. Right. We want to try to help. We want you to have the good life, too. Uh, we want you to have a decent education. We can't pay for it all. We must not raise expectations about what we can do, but we have to say to those folks, uh, we're on your side. One way we could say we're on your side, Lee, and be sensitive and not get too big for our britches in a sense or promise too much, yeah. might be to uh, revisit something that we did so effectively after World War II, and that was create multinational institutions, the UN, the World Bank. Those things are still around. Yeah. And I, I, I love to get your sense mm -hmm. of how, uh, how we might act through them yeah. to, to approach some of these issues I think, in the world. Uh, I think that too is a good point because uh, a lot of things can be done better through the multilateral organization than by ourselves. Right. Uh, so I think we have to be able to use these tools which, as you suggest, we created. Mm -hmm. now, you got a real problem of governance here, don't you? I mean, the, the problems have kind of uh, outstripped our ability to deal with them. Uh, and uh, nobody is arguing, I think, today, I certainly am not, for world government. But on the other hand, you have to have international institutions that can deal more effectively with the problem of inequality or the other problems that come along. What does that mean? That means you have to strengthen, mm -hmm. make more efficient, make more effective. Reform. Reform of the United Nations, of the IMF, of the World Bank, of the WTO, just on down the list. These institutions, and, and incidentally, some very good people are uh, uh, working in those organizations, but they just aren't performing as well mm -hmm. as the world needs them to perform. Yeah, I think I'd agree uh, with that, Lee. Yeah. Would, would you add to that, Lee? Because I think you're absolutely right yeah. that the, the, uh, they can be made more efficient, they can be made to work better. Should we have different actors? I'm, I, what I'm thinking of is, Countries like Brazil, uh, India, that we mentioned earlier, are now emerging. Should they be in places like the Security Council? Should they be playing different roles in these in these organizations? Uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council were set up after World War II, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know that's uh, many many years ago. Mm -hmm. It no longer reflects the power situation in the world. And if you have an emergence of a China or an India, well, of course, China is a permanent member. Uh, or of, of an India or a regional power like Indonesia or a regional power like Brazil, uh, I think the Security Council personally has to reflect that mm -hmm. power change. 
Now, reforming the Security Council has proven to be hugely difficult, very, very difficult. Japan, the number two power in the world, uh, not a member of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make much sense, frankly, uh, to me. Uh, Germany, powerful country, the most powerful country in Europe, not a member of the Security Council. Uh, so I think uh, you do need to change the Security Council in a way that it reflects the realities of, of the, the world. world. Maybe, yeah. no, maybe not the way we like them, but the mm -hmm. realities of the world. And I, uh, I understand saying that is easy and bringing it about is exceedingly difficult. But I think saying that is important, yeah. Lee. Yeah. I think yeah. saying that is very important. Lee, in fact, everything that you said throughout our conversation I think has been extremely uh, helpful to me and everyone watching. And I will leave this conversation with uh, many things in mind, among them perhaps prominently, most prominently this. You've stressed integration mm -hmm. at, in various ways throughout this. And as we come to the close of it, uh, our conversation today, I'd love to get your sense of integration as kind of the prime mover in achieving collective security mm -hmm. in the world we're about to uh, move into. It's interesting that you connect integration to collective security because collective security is a world, word that you and I know, mm -hmm. uh, old folks, uh, because <laughs> right. it, it's, it's a word out of the past. Mm -hmm. But the concept is a good one. And what it means is that the United States uses uh, uh, other nations to help it achieve its goals right. and understands we cannot do it unilaterally. We have to work together integrate our power with their power, persuade them that the kinds of things we want in the world are not just good for us, mm -hmm. good for them as well. That's, That's the principle of integration, which is at, at the root of collective security. Collective security served us very well mm -hmm. uh, during the post-World War period, right. and I think it can again. I do too. I think it's a marvelous thing for yeah. us to go away from this conversation with. Thank you, Lee Hamilton. Thank you. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston, CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. And please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. I don't